Um, so it's my uh, pleasure to be able to introduce Maria today. Um, quite recently, Maria is looking for a postdoc position, and I was asked to provide a, a reference letter for her to uh, Doug Green, who I'm sure you know is one of the, the giants in, in the cell death field. And I wrote just two sentences, and I'll, I'll read them out to you. Um, quite simply brilliant, extremely hardworking, very smart, very competent, super pleasant, and impossibly modest. O only I could think you could be impossibly modest, but, uh, but, but Maria is impossibly modest. modest. I had wanted to write, and she is way too good for you. <laughs> But I, I sort of struck that out at the end. Um, possibly, uh, probably, she is way too good for me, too. But I have been very fortunate to work together with her. And we'll hear today just a small fraction of what she's done. And I think you'll get a good taste for, for why I, I, I'm so impressed with her and, and able to write such, such a glowing uh, reference letter. And. I think that I should let her tell you about what she's done. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. So I guess it's probably I shouldn't start with my presentation now. It can just get worse. Uh, but um, so during my PhD, I uh, studied how signaling of certain cytokines is regulated and how this may result in cell death. And as you can see here in the opening slide, I mainly focused on interferon gamma. Oops. Okay, it starts already. I focused on interferon gamma and TNF signaling. Uh, in general, cytokines are very important for de developmental processes, but also essential for fighting infections and other immune responses. And um, the, the simple principle of cytokine uh, signaling comprises three major steps, beginning with the binding of the ligand to its receptor. And this induces the second step, which is the activation of signaling cascades. And one cytokine can induce many, many different signaling cascades, of which many induce transcription. And the activation of the signaling pathways and transcription influence the third step, which is the outcome. So cytokines can induce differentiation, proliferation, just any change of the current state of the cell, and also the production of more cytokines. And they can also lead to apoptosis and uh, to cell death. And the cell death can either be inflammatory, like necroptosis, or anti-inflammatory, like apoptosis. However, the question we are most interested in is how can one type of cytokine induce so many different signaling cascades and so many different outcomes, and how is this regulated? We know that the amount of cytokines is important, the type of cytokine, but, and also the type, the cell type, the, uh, the cell that is exposed to the cytokines, but there is an additional factor that is poorly studied, and uh, this factor is the presence of more cytokines, because a cell is rarely, in the organism, is rarely exposed to a single cytokine. It's always exposed to a range of different cytokines. And they induce signaling pathways, pathways that interact with each other. They cross talk. And therefore, in, in 2012, already before I started with my PhD, John suggested a project to look at the crosstalk of cytokine signaling. And as the lab is mainly focused on TNF signaling, um, it fit very well to look at interferon gamma and TNF. Because both are pro-inflammatory cytokines, they are pro both produced by similar types, cell types, upon viral and bacterial infection and sterile inflammation. And they both can lead to cell death, and I will mainly talk about that, but they can also induce the production of more cytokines that help the organism fight infections. And they both have also common target genes that are involved in the transmembrane adhesion and recognition, and also they can also both induce the same cytokines and chemokines and transcription factors. And there are also um, already early experiments showing that interferon gamma and TNF, they act at the same place together. Here, for example, in 1994, a group published an experiment where they treated mice uh, or they injected LPS into mice to induce um, the LPS shock. 
and uh, 50 hours after injection, most of the mice died. When they pretreated the mice with anti-TNF or anti-interferon gamma, they could partially block this death. And when they pretreated the mice with both anti-TNF and anti-interferon gamma, all the mice were protected from LPS-induced shock. However, um, my PhD, or in my doing my PhD, we probably didn't come as far as we planned, uh, but uh, I basically worked on all three of these uh, steps of the cytokine signaling. And I, we started first to look at um, the interferon gamma and TNF uh, signaling receptors, and we noticed that the TNF signaling receptor, we know a lot about the TNF signaling receptor and the component, components that influence each other, whereas we know less about the interferon gamma signaling complex. And so I tried to apply the techniques that we use to investigate the TNF signaling complex on interferon gamma, on the identification of novel members of the interferon gamma signaling complex. Um, then in a second part, like as a second project, um, we looked at a cell death that is induced by interferon gamma and smegmamatic. So smegmomatic are small inhibitors that are, have been already involved in the induction of apoptosis and necroptosis. And in the third part, I will uh, mainly talk about our work that we have done on the role of ML Kelly necroptosis, mainly downstream of um, the TNF signaling complex. Uh, so starting off with uh, the first project, which is the identification identification of novel members of the interferon gamma signaling complex. And um, just to follow Jeff Bevan's lead, uh, I will also use my favorite hobby to um, uh, make an analogy for the complexity of both signaling complexes, which is mo uh, watching movies. So I think that um, I guess the TNF signaling complex is probably as complicated as an episode of Game of Thrones, at least for me. Um, and the Jack's that signaling pathway probably similar to the Pride and Prejudice movie where two components, almost just two components, uh, come together and that's enough for the story. <laughs> but um, we are actually convinced that it's not as simple as it seems because both cytokines are very important and they have to be tightly regulated. And we are convinced that there are additional regulators that influence the interferon gamma signaling. <laughs> so generally, both uh, cytokine signaling complexes are different. So whereas the TNF signaling mainly works via the building of these ubiquitin platforms that allow kinases to bind and activate the nf kappa b pathway and um, activate transcription, um, whereas uh, the interferon gamma signaling is a classical JAK-STAT signaling pathway. So the interferon gamma signaling complex consists of two interferon gamma receptor chain one and two interferon gamma receptor chain two. And um, the kinases JAK1 and JAK2 are constitutively associated with the interferon gamma receptor chains. And upon stimulation with the dimeric interferon gamma ligand, these JAK1 and JAK2 become transactivated, and they also phosphorylate a motif in the interferon gamma receptor chain one, which allows that one to bind. And uh, it gets phosphorylated, it uh, translocates into the nucleus and induces transcription of many target genes. And one of these target genes is SOX1, which is probably the most prominent inhibitor of the interferon gamma signaling. It can either directly inhibit the kinase activity of the JAKs, or it can also help with the ubiquitination of um, members of the interferon gamma signaling complex, which leads to their degradation. So our first approach to identify novel interacting partners of the interferon gamma signaling complex was uh, to generate um, interferon gamma ligand, which has a strep his stack. So we would basically uh, treat the cells with this ligand, and this ligand would then allow us to pull this complex out of the lysate, and then we could just send the sample to mass spec, and this would allow us to identify all the proteins that are binding to the complex. So first, we generated an N-terminal tagged interferon gamma ligand, and so we tried to purify it out of the supernatant by using the strep tag and the strep beads, but unfortunately, we failed to elude it off the beads. So then we changed strategy and uh, generated a C-terminal tagged interferon gamma ligand and uh, purified it all out of the supernatant, again, by using the strep tag. This time, it worked. So the next step was 
putting the two different ligands on the cells, and then we use the his tag to pull down the receptor complex with the Niklant A beads and the strap tag this, uh, for the C-terminal interferon gamma ligand to pull down um, the uh, complex with the streptactin beads. But unfortunately, both failed, and we think this is due to the low receptor number of uh, the cells. So we changed strategy uh, from using the ligand, which would actually allow us to pull down the endogenous receptor, to directly tagging the receptor chain, so interferon gamma receptor chain one and chain two. And so this allows us to directly pull down the receptor complex. But first we had to make sure that the strap doesn't interfere with the signaling, and thereby we use the fact that interferon gamma signaling is species specific, which means we cannot use mouse interferon gamma to, uh, to stimulate human cells, like here U937s, which are human lymphom lymphoma cell lines. So if uh, we treat these U937s with a mouse interferon gamma, we cannot detect phosphorylation of STAT1, which is our readout for um, interferon gamma signaling. Whereas when we treat them with human interferon gamma, we can see a nice signal of phosphorylation of STAT1. So when we overexpress the mouse interferon gamma receptor chain, so here chain two is untagged and chain one is tagged with the strep his, and then we stimulate these human cells with the mouse interferon gamma, we can detect nice phosphorylation of STAT1. And indicating that the strap of the chain one doesn't interfere with the signaling. And when we overexpress the both chains tagged, we see again a nice phosphorylation of that one indicating we can continue with the experiments because the tag doesn't interfere with the signaling. So what we basically did was overexpressing the interferon gamma receptor chains in mouse dermal fibroblasts. We uh, either left the cells untreated or treated them for five minutes with interferon gamma. And then we lysed the cells, performed the pull down, so pulled down specifically the receptor chains, and then prepared the samples for mass spec and analyzed uh, the mass spec results using the max quant software and the in-house pipeline for the statistics. And these are the results. So here we compare uh, the cells where we specifically pull down the interferon gamma receptor chain one and chain two because both are tagged. And here we treat the cells with interferon gamma compared to the cells, the same cells where we also specifically pull down chain one and chain two but without interferon gamma. So if we add interferon gamma and pull down both receptor chains, we see uh, enrichment for interferon gamma itself, which we would expect. But we also see a highly significant enrichment for STAT1. Um, so all the proteins above the green line are highly significantly enriched, and all the proteins above the red line are significantly enriched. So for example, JAK1 is not significantly enriched, and this fits very well with the literature, because it's known that JAK1 is constitutively associated with the chain, so independent of interferon gamma stimulation or not. But that one can just bind to the receptor when, um, it, when the receptor is activated because the tyrosine motif on chain one has to be phosphorylated. But as you can see here, unfortunately, we didn't detect any other protein that would be significantly enriched upon addition of interferon gamma. So then we compared um, the other cell line where we have just the interferon gamma receptor chain one tagged. So with interferon gamma and without interferon gamma, if we just pull down specifically chain one and add interferon gamma, we can see again interferon gamma is enriched compared to the same cell line without interferon gamma. But we could also detect that we uh, an enrichment for the interferon gamma receptor chain two. And um, this is uh, consistent with previous findings, so very early findings already 20 years ago, where they showed that the interferon gamma receptor chains are not pre-associated, and just upon the treatment with interferon gamma, both chains assemble. But uh, this theory was uh, challenged in 2002 because uh, the group of Sidney Pesca, who did a lot of work on interference signaling, they claimed that the interferon gamma receptor chains are constitutively associated using a FRET system, and just upon binding of the ligand, they would undergo a conformational change, and this would then lead to signaling. But we, um, with this experiment, we can confirm the previous results. And we could also detect another protein called SPTSC2 uh, to be highly significantly enriched when we add interferon gamma and uh, pull down the interferon gamma receptor chain one. And so when we compare the two different cell lines, so here we just pull down specifically chain one, and here we pull down chain one and chain two. So when we add, when we additionally pull down chain two, we can see an enrichment for the interferon gamma receptor chain two, which we would expect. 
But we can also detect SBTSC2 and SBTSC1, again, indicating that they interact with the interferon gamma receptor chain 2, independent of interferon gamma stimulation, because in this setup we haven't added any interferon gamma. So just to summarize uh, these results, so from these results we conclude that interferon gamma receptor chains are not pre-associated, but inter when um, without interferon gamma, but uh, SBTSC2 is constitutively binding to the interferon gamma receptor chain 2. And when we add interferon gamma, the two chains, chain 1 and chain 2, associate, and therefore we are also able to detect SBTSC2 when we specifically just pull down the interferon gamma receptor chain 1 because it is indirectly interacting via interferon gamma receptor chain 2. And just to confirm the mass spec results, we also did the Western blot uh, to see when we uh, specific when we pull down both chains, we can detect SBTSC2 independent of interferon gamma stimulation. But when we just pull down uh, chain one, we uh, detect uh, a faint band of SBTSC2 when we add interferon gamma, but not when there is no um, interferon gamma. So what is SBTSC2? It's a long chain based subunit of the serine palmitoyl transferase. Uh, the serine palmitoyl transferase attaches uh, oh, palmitic acid on their target proteins at the serine and it is also a very important initial enzyme in the sphingolipid bio, uh, biosynthesis. And sphingolipids are important components of the membrane and they are also enriched in lipid rafts which are known to be important for signaling. And to test whether SBTSC2 has an effect in interferon gamma signaling, we generated SBTSC2 knockout or um, uh, cells deficient or reduced uh, with reduced levels of SBTSC2. And then we uh, checked interferon gamma signaling via the blo um, Western blot with uh, phosphorylation of STAT1. So here we uh, generated CRISPR Cas9 um, cells in mouse dermal fibroblasts and raw cells, so mouse macrophages. And when we uh, always when we detect um, uh, reduction or complete deficiency of SBTSC2, we can also detect a reduction of phosphorylation of STAT1 in both cell lines, indicating that SBTSC2 might be required for full activation of interferon gamma. Now, as this project is currently ongoing, um, our next plans are to test uh, or to use the SBTSC2 deficient cells and to test induction of target genes using qPCR of target genes of interferon gamma. And then we will also test um, whether the deficiency of SBTSC2 has an effect on the translocation of the interferon gamma receptor complex into lipid rafts and in endocytosis. And as you can see here, so SBTSC2 is mainly localized in the endoplasmatic reticulum, so we don't know yet when interferon gamma receptor chain 2 is interacting with SBTSC2. They could interact in the ER and then move to the plasma membrane together. And um, another important fact is that we don't know yet is whether the interferon gamma receptor chain 2 is palmitylated by the serine palmitylase. And to test this, we will perform targeted mass spectrometry uh, to, yeah, to detect palmitylation of both uh, interferon gamma receptor chain 1 and chain 2. So uh, this brings me then um, to the second project. Uh, so here we looked at interferon gamma and smegma medic induced cell death. So the interferon gamma receptor is not a cell death receptor, uh, but it has been um, implicated in cell death already because interferon gamma also induces um, proteins that are involved in cell death. And um, these proteins, for example, are caspase 8, caspase 3, or death ligands. And very earlier reports already showed that interferon gamma can synergize with death ligands like tweak, TNF, and lymphotoxin to um, induce cell death. Here, for example, they treated HD29 cells, so colon cancer cells, and keto 3 cells, which is a gastric cancer cell line, um, with increasing concentrations of tweak, and they could not detect any major differences in the survival. But when they added interferon gamma on top, they could um, see a synergistic cell death with interferon gamma and tweak. But um, in these uh, publications, they never explained the mechanism. So more recently, in 2008, James Vince and John published a paper where they showed that the tweak signaling induces um, lysosomal degradation of the CIP1 and TREF2 complex, and this sensitizes cells to TNF. So what does that mean? Um, so the TNF binds to its receptor, 
when we add TNF to the cells, it binds to its receptors and uh, to its receptor, and it induces the recruitment of many members of the complex, like TREF2, TREF1, CIP1 and 2. So CIP1 and 2 are the three ligases that are very important for the ubiquitination of many components of the complex. One of them is also RIP1. And so nf kappa b signaling is activated and cytokines and pro-survival mediators can be produced. Now there, next to this receptor complex, there is also a cytoplasmic complex, which also consists of TREF2 and CRP1 and 2, but it also consists of caspase 8. But here caspase 8 is not active because FLIP inhibits caspase 8. So they showed that when they add tweak, um, this uh, tweak signal induces lysosomal degradation of CIP1 and TREF2. And this prevented the formation of this receptor complex, and it also prevented the formation of this cytoplasmic complex. And instead of this, an alternative complex is formed, which leads to the activation of caspase 8, and there is no FLIP uh, produced anymore, and apoptosis can occur. And so we thought this, or they thought, this could be um, the mechanism underlying the interferon gamma and tweak induced cell death. Um, now to test this further, in 2006, Nufail Khan started with his PhD and he uh, started this project. So first he wanted to repeat the results the, other, the others published. So he treated the HD29, D605 and Keto3 cells with interferon gamma and tweak and could see synergistic killing. Um, now, as the lab is mainly interested in using smegma medics, um, they wondered whether interferon gamma and smegma medics would have the same effect as interferon gamma and tweak, because smegma medics basically act the same as tweak. They also lead to the degradation of IAPs, and they also prevent the formation of this cytoplasmic complex and trigger apoptosis. To test this, he uh, treated cells with interferon gamma and smegma medic and could indeed see synergistic killing. And so we followed this um, cell death. So to test first whether nf kappa b signaling and jex signaling is important, he uh, used uh, two different cell lines where he overexpressed first the I-kappa b super repressor to block nf kappa b signaling, and he could see that when he treated cells with interferon gamma and smegma medic, here shown by the white bars, he could see a reduction when he overexpressed the I-kappa b super repressor. Um, indicating that nf kappa b signaling is important. And the same is for the overexpression of SOX1. So when he overexpressed SOX1 and induced interferon gamma signaling, he could see a reduction of cell death compared uh, to no SOX1 overexpression. So coming back to the cell death, um, so when we did blood for cast spaces or PARP, like here, we could see PARP cleavage, so that was evidence for apoptosis. Uh, but as I mentioned before, smegmomedics have also been involved in inducing necroptosis. So if we block this uh, apoptosis by inhibiting the caspase, like uh, caspase 8, um, we trigger the formation of another complex, which is the necrosome, which is consisting of RIPK1 and RIPK3. So this leads to the activation of RIPK3, which then phosphorylates and activates MLKL, and this moves to the membrane and um, induces cell death. Now to test whether necroptosis and apoptosis contribute to this interferon gamma and smegmomatic induced cell death, we uh, treated the cells also with inhibitors against apoptosis and necroptosis. So again, he treated the cells with um, uh, the three different cell lines with interferon gamma and smegmomatic, and additionally also QVD to block, uh, to block apoptosis. And he could see that uh, the cell line D645 was completely protected, indicating that they are just dying via apoptosis. Now, um, HD29 and CATO3 cells were still sensitive, though, so they can still undergo necroptosis. Um, so then he just treated the cells with necrostatin, and all the cells were still sensitive because they can undergo caspase 8 mediated apoptosis. And so he treated the cells with both QVD and necrostatin. So necrostatin is an inhibitor uh, for the kinase of RIPK1, kinase activity of RIPK1, so it blocks necroptosis. So when he treated uh, cells with both QVD and necro necrostatin 1, he could see a significant protection of CATO3 cells, but uh, the HD29 cells were still largely sensitive, and that was very surprising. So this could be either because of the inhibitors, that they are not efficient enough, or uh, that there is an additional 
signal uh, like pathway uh, how the cells can die through. And to test this further, we uh, use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to generate HD29 cells um, that lack caspase 8. And if we treat them with interferon gamma and smegmatic, they are still sensitive. Um, and as expected, we can detect phosphorylation of MLKL, which means activation of MLKL, indicating that necroptosis is active when caspase 8 is not present, but surprisingly, we could also detect uh, cleaved caspase 3, and that was really surprising because caspase 8 was not missing, indicating, uh, or caspase 8 was missing, so what else is cleaving caspase 3? So indicating that there might be an, another pathway, another caspase important. And then we also got rid of necroptosis on top of caspase 8 using uh, or generating double knockout HD29, so cells that lack RIP1 caspase 8, RIP3 caspase 8, and Cal caspase 8, and when we tested them for their sensitivity for interferon gamma and smegmatic, we could see that RIP3 caspase 8 here in blue and MLKL caspase 8 here in green are still largely sensitive to interferon gamma and smegmatic, whereas RIP1 caspase 8 double knockouts were largely protected indicating that MLKL um, induces or has a function in this interferon gamma and smegmatic induced cell death independent of its role in necroptosis. And when we add QVD to interferon gamma and smegmatic, we can reduce the cell death detected in RIP3 caspase 8 and MLKL caspase 8 double knockouts, again showing that it's a caspase uh, dependent a pathway, this alternative pathway. Just to look at um, cleaved caspase 3, so as I showed you before, if there is no caspase 8, cells still show cleaved caspase 3, indicating that there is an additional caspase. But if we uh, look for cleaved caspase 3 in RIP1 caspase 8 double knockouts, we fail to detect it, indicating that RIP1 might be important um, for the activity of this uh, caspase. And uh, RIP3 caspase 8 and MLKL caspase 8 double knock knockout show in strikingly increase of cleaved caspase 3, indicating that the missing caspase might have a preference, or the, the caspase playing a role here, might have a preference for caspase 3, uh, higher than caspase 8. And um, so there is just another caspase that uh, is known to play a role in the extrinsic pathway, and uh, this is caspase 10. So caspase 10 is a poorly studied caspase because it's also just present in human cells. And there are some reports that show it has inhibitory function, functions. Other reports shows, show that um, it uh, also has redundant functions like with caspase 8. And when we looked at caspase 10 levels, we were really surprised because when we treated the HD29 cells with interferon gamma, we could already see this huge upregulation of caspase 10 levels. And when we treated the same cells with interferon gamma and smegmatic, we could see this large increase of cleaved uh, or process caspase 10. And this was also the case in MLKL caspase 8 and RIP3 caspase 8 double knockouts, indicating that caspase 10 is processed also independent of caspase 8. And um, I just like to draw your attention to the smallest cleave product so we can always detect this when we also detect cell death, indicating um, that this might be a good indicator for um, full activation of caspase 10. But then to fully prove uh, that uh, caspase 10 is actually the caspase important in this alternative apoptotic cell death pathway, we generated again CRISPR-Cas9 knockouts. So first we generated cells that lack caspase 10. Um, and here you can see they are still as sensitive as the wild type because the cells can still die via caspase 8 mediated apoptosis and necroptosis. So if we block uh, necroptosis on top of caspase 10, cells are still sensitive because they die via caspase 8. So if we then block uh, caspase 8, caspase 10 and necroptosis, we then can then finally protect the cells quite uh, successfully. And um, just to test um, that RIP1 has an important function for caspase 10 full activation, we, um, we looked at the caspase 10 processing in RIP1 caspase 8 deficient cells compared to wild types and MLKL caspase 8 deficient cells. And when we treated them with interferon gamma and smegmatic, we can detect the smallest cleave product 
cells. So it's quite weak here with um, uh, in wild type cells and in ML calcaspase A deficient cells, but not when cells are lacking RIPK1. And um, this is also nicely mirrored by the cleaved caspase 3 blot. And this indicates that RIP1 is required for the activation of cas or full activation of caspase 10 which uh, leads me to the summary of this project. Uh, so here we showed that um, treating cells with interferon gamma and smegmomatic, um, the cells die mainly via apoptosis, which is caspase 8 mediated. It can also has an involvement of caspase 10. Um, so if we block caspase 8, cells undergo necroptosis and apoptosis at the same time. But if we block um, necroptosis and uh, caspase 8, and, um, cells can still undergo caspase 10 mediated apoptosis. So we have to block all three pathways, so caspase 10 and caspase 8 mediated apoptosis and necroptosis to uh, fully block uh, interferon gamma and smegmomatic induced cell death. And so now I'm switching to the third project, uh, which mainly focuses on um, MLKL and its role in necroptosis and this down, mainly downstream of the TNF signaling complex. So MLKL is uh, the most downstream essential member of the necroptotic pathway known. And as I mentioned before, so TNF and smegmomatic treatment prevents uh, the formation of this uh, receptor complex and also the cytoplasmic complex and triggers caspase 8 activation. Now, if we block uh, caspase 8 activity using caspase inhibitors like QVD, um, we trigger this necrosome uh, formation where RIP3 is activated, which then activates MLKL and this induces cell death. So this is the crystal structure of MLKL. It, uh, it is solved by James Murphy and Peter Sabota, and it consists of a four helical bundle, which is connected via two helices, the brace with the pseudokinase domain. We call the four helical bundle and the brace the N-terminal domain. And so this was the model that we, or, yeah, or this was what we knew before we started uh, working on MLKL. So it has been shown before that MLKL is important in necroptosis. So, uh, and it has been also shown that phosphorylation of RIPK3 at its activation loop induces the activation of MLKL. And some other publications show that it translocates to the membrane and induces cell death. Now, we could show that just the overexpression of the N-terminal domain alone is enough to induce cell death. And actually, this just the expression of the four helical bundle would be already enough. We just always also included the brace because it uh, harbors the epitope for our antibody, so we could make sure it's expressed. But this basically indicates that when we take away the pseudokinase and just express this N-terminal domain or just the four helical bundle, um, it induces cell death, indicating that the pseudokinase domain in the steady state level of the cell has an inhibitory effect. And so this led uh, to this uh, model where we then could uh, hypothesize that phosphorylation of RIPK3 of MLKL at its um, activation loop induces this conformational change, which unleashes the four helical bundle and so MLKL can be active and induce cell death at the membrane. So in course of the investigation of membrane translocation to, um, or of MLKL translocation to the membrane, we performed crude membrane fractionations using digitonin. So we ran um, the fractions or, or fractionations on um, blue native phage and we could see in wild type mouse domal fibroblasts that in untreated cells, most of the MLKL is localized in the cytoplasm. And when we treat the cells with three or six hours of TNF, smegmomatic, and QVD to induce necroptosis, um, MLKL translocates into this high molecular weight complex in the membrane. And this is the same also in human cells. And for human cells, we can uh, luckily also use a very good um, antibody against human phosphorylated MLKL. And here we could see that more, uh, all of all of the phosphorylated MLKL is localized in this high molecular weight fraction. And this indicates that MLKL um, oligomyces, although we don't know whether there are other proteins present in this complex, uh, but this indicates that MLKL oligomyces when it's active. And um, just another experiment that shows this, so when we force oligomerization of full-length MLKL by fusing this full-length MLKL to the gyrus, which allows dimerization upon addition of cumamycin, we can detect induction of cell death when we add cumamycin. 
um, which then um, leaves us with uh, this hypothesis that upon uh, phosphorylation, this conformational change occurs, and then Amel undergoes oligo oligomyces and translocates into or to the membrane. Now, it's still not clear how exactly MLCAL induces cell death and how exactly it acts at the membrane. So there are different models. It can either other, or like other people claim that it binds to uh, the ion channel, which induces ion influx. Others say it can directly bind to the membrane and induce membrane ruptures, and others say it forms a pore. But we still don't know. So our approach to investigate um, the four helical bundle, which is the killer domain, was to perform alanine mutagenesis screen to detect several residues that are important for its killing. Uh, so we basically selected several residues on the surface of the four helical bundle and mutated them to alanine. And then we expressed these N-terminal domain mutants in MLKL knockout mouse stomal fibroblasts and induced expression here seen by the white bars. And here you can see in contrast to the wild up N-terminal domain that induces a high amount of cell death, several mutants fail to induce cell death. And so we divided these mutants into uh, mutants of cluster one and cluster two according to their ability to translocate uh, to this high molecular weight complex in the membrane because mutations of, um, in cluster one, they prevent that the N-terminal domain translocates into this high molecular weight complex. Various mutations uh, of cluster two, they still allow the N-terminal domain to translocate to the membrane, uh, but this, the mutants are still unable to induce cell death. And this really indicates that MLKL translocation is essential and oligomerization is essential, but it's not sufficient, um, which uh, then leaves us to hypothesize that there are additional components at the membrane that are important for cell death induction. They might either act downstream of um, MLKL or together with MLKL to induce cell death. Now, this data was mainly generated by looking at mouse MLKL in mouse cells. So we were also wondering whether human MLKL behaves like mouse MLKL, and therefore we um, overexpressed the human N-terminal domain in human cells, like U937s, HeLa cells, and HD29, HeLa cervical cancer cell line. So in none of these three cell lines, we were able to induce cell death overexpressing the human N-terminal domain compared to the cell that we can induce with mouse and terminal domain in mouse cells, indicating that mouse MLKL and human MLKL are fundamentally different. So we can induce um, cell death uh, with human four helical bundle, but just when we induce dimerization with cumamycin, again showing the difference between mouse and human MLKL. So we were wondering whether this is an in Protein intrinsic effect, whether uh, MLKL is just not able to oligomize itself and to uh, kill. Uh, but uh, it was surprising that uh, recombinant human MLKL, so the N-terminal domain and recombinant human full-length MLKL, was able to permeabilize liposomes with a preference for liposomes that resemble the plasma membrane like the other ML, recombinant MLKL. And so this uh, leaves me with um, our final and current model, um, which shows that MLKL undergoes this conformational change. It oligomyces, translocates to the nucleus, uh, sorry, to the plasma membrane. And, um, but we are convinced that there are additional regulators um, that can regulate MLKL function and activation in all of these steps. Um, and we just published a paper that shows that HSP90 um, is an important chaperone for the activation of um, MLKL after phosphorylation via RIP3. And this just leaves me with a take home message slide. So we basically identified an, a novel interactor of the interferon gamma receptor complex which might uh, be important for its uh, signaling. Then we also identified and could for the first time conclusively show that caspase 10 induces apoptosis. This is dependent on RIPON and independent of caspase 8. Um, and then we could also show that the uh, four helical bundle of ML is, in, is enough to induce cell death, the expression of the four helical bundle. Uh, but we also showed compelling evidence that um, there are additional regulators that are important for the activation of MLKL. And this just leaves me with acknowledgement. Um, I have to acknowledge and thank so many people. First and most, John, 
for all his support, motivation, and ideas, and especially being so far away from home and knowing no one here, I think I could not have chosen better supervisor and lab to go to. And then I also have to um, thank Joanne, who was always there helping me uh, with, for her great ideas, also critical questions and advices in the lab with experiments. Thanks to jo uh, James for um, being um, really or uh, being available to work or, or for allowing me to work with, on the MLCAL project. And it was really fun. And thanks for his quick replies with the emails. And then um, Sam and, and Indy for helping me with um, uh, experiments on the MLCAL project. Jared and Andrew, who are both my supervisors, helping me a lot with the mass spec experiments. And of course, Nima, who um, helped me a lot, especially at the beginning, uh, uh, answering all my silly questions. And um, thanks to Nufi and James, who did so much work on the Interfin Gamma and Smagmomatic project before I even arrived. Then the whole silk club, um, according to the hierarchy, how it should be. First the postdocs, thanks to Nish, Gavi, and Uli, who, um, who are really also great mentors. I can talk uh, about them, about everything, and not just science. And um, former and current RAs in the lab who make the place a really pleasant and fun place to work at. And I can just say the same about the students. It's really fun with you guys. And uh, Laura and Pepe, help, uh, thanks for their help in, with the mass spec. The committee, Sandra, Liam, and Andreas, thanks for always coming to my talks and the committee meetings. Also, Devo and C the whole CSCD. And also, all the people that helped me, especially Marco providing all the CRISPR constructs, the fax lab, animal, animal facility, although I really haven't done much animal work, mouse work. And of course, thanks to family and friends, especially friends here who made uh, life outside of the lab uh, really fun. And uh, thanks also to family and friends at home who are always willing to spend hours and hours on Skype. So thank you for coming. So that was a perfect cameo of the whole PhD, a hell of a lot in a short time. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Yes. So you, you implied that your, um, in your first story, the interferon gamma story, that your, your model is more consistent, I guess, with the um, two chains being dissociated and then <coughs> together, is that right? Yes. So it, could it be that under the conditions that you've used to do your extraction that you're just destabilizing those two chains? Is it that upon interferon gamma signal yeah. it undergoes a confirmation change which is more stable and that's why there's a difference? Yeah, that could be. But um, so basically they did um, like they did also an overexpression with the FRAT signal. Yeah. It we can also not exclude that this happens post lysis, that it kind of no, we cannot exclude so that. You didn't try maybe doing some cross linking, I guess. No, no, we haven't done that. No, we can't yeah. The serine pyramidal A's enzyme, um, yes. do you know if it's associated with any, with any other cytokine receptors? No, I haven't found any data on that. Yeah, I looked for it, but uh, there is a lot of palmitylation occurring, but it's mainly cysteine residues. And generally, palmitylation is important to anchor proteins at the membrane. So, but I haven't found anything. <clears throat> so the interferon gamma still signals in your SPT LC to uh, knockouts, yes. Knockouts. Um, and this is all an overexpressed receptor with history and tagged receptor, right? No, uh, like uh, when I did perform the or generated the CRISPR knockouts, I uh, generated the, the SPTLC2 knockouts in cells that don't overexpress the receptor, like raw cells, for example, they didn't overexpress the receptor. Do you still detect the SPT for C1 in that? I didn't do any pull down. Because you can't pull it down properly. No, because the endogenous, I so was how not in. It's working in an endogenous situation. Um, what do you mean that it's interacting with? We cannot, finally, we cannot conclude that because I haven't done any experiment that where I pull down endogenous receptor and see SPTSC2, but um, we did the, this was a functional readout where we knocked out SPTSC2 and then checked whether interferon gamma signaling was compromised. But we cannot, we cannot say that it's in the endogenous, interacting endogenously. Oh, we still, you still get lots of step one phosphorylation. 
Yes. But it's lower than if you have. Yes. That. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we, I'm now currently doing experiments like using SBTSC2 antibodies to see the chains and getting better in different gamma receptor antibodies. That would help too. And whether the full amount of uh, interferon gamma receptor is there at the cell surface, that would be yeah, sort of that's the first question, whether it perhaps mislocalized or th those are some questions. But definitely there is some signaling, it's not completely gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Mark? Um, are mouse cells resistant to gamma-induced death if you block caspase 8 and MMKL? Um, MDFs, uh, they are the, if you block caspase 8, they undergo necroptosis. If you block MLKL, they still undergo apoptosis. But we found that the mouse cells, this, uh, the pathway is dependent on RIP3, which activates caspase 8, and then this leads to apoptosis. Yeah, so, so if you block both those pathways, they don't go. Yeah, they are completely protected. So caspase 10 is not, yeah. yeah that's so right. every single experiment that she did to show you for the human, she also did for the mouse, but just to make life easy. Yeah. Right. Um, in your HT29 knockouts, yes. with, even with the four genes knocked out, there was still nearly 30% cell death, which you said no cell death. No, there's a large protection, that's right. There's still, um, let's say, 20% more cell death than in the untreated. Yeah. It's not completely, completely protected. So there's some other pathway? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that to work out this pathway in case base 10, that took us about six years. Yeah. So I'll be bugging if I'm going to find out that you remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you're absolutely right. There's still something there. Yeah. Now, is it to do with the sort of uh, cytostatic effect or whatever? But that is the best protection we've ever seen if we get rid of all three. And it gets down to the level of QBD. And yeah. Yeah. And we still don't know like what is upstream, like what is inducing this activation. Is it just the upregulation of caspase 8 and caspase 10? <laughs> Yeah, is there some? We were looking for other candidates that like BKR, TRIF, DAI, whether they might induce the cell death, but they didn't we play any role. We looked at autophagy, we yeah. looked at so many things, yeah. and all of them came up uh, way less effective than that. So, in the end, we were to say, just happy that we get it down to that much protection. Any more questions? All right, then, just remains thank you.